What is it, my friend? Welcome to episode 145 of the Anthony John Weeks podcast. Man, it feels good to be back. I mean, it's been 18 months of just straight up producing this show, working with clients. Uh, a lot has been going on. And so I just decided to take a little break to create some space and just reset. And man, it was a much needed a break. And it feels really, really, really good to be back. Uh, during my time off from the podcast, I came up with a new format. I think you're really going to enjoy it. And today I'm going to be using that new format with today's guest. He's a former Zen monk and he has just some incredible insights to share with you. So if you're at a place where you're looking for a way to like take back and reclaim like even more of your personal power, lead your teams, lead your home life better and just be a better human being, sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Anthony John Amix podcast. The one and only podcast designed to help you become unstoppable in life and business. My name is Anthony John Amix. My friends call me AJ. And my goal with this podcast is to help you remember who you truly are so you can maintain your center in the chaos, embody your potential, and unlock freedom in your life and business. That being said, let's get into today's show. All right, welcome back. Now, before I tell you about today's guest, I want to share with you how you can get access to some insanely great personal development training. It's all about how to rewire and transform your subconscious patterns in 90 days or less so you can embody your potential and unlock freedom in your life and business. And you can get immediate access to that training by going to trainingwithaj.com. There's no opt-in, there's nothing of that nature. Simply go to trainingwithaj.com. If you wanna learn how to take advantage of some unconventional wisdom to embodying your potential and creating life on your terms. now. That being said, let me tell you about today's guest. His name is Alan Knight. He's a former Zen monk, and he has spent more of his life infusing Eastern philosophical wisdom into a practical nine-step formula to help ensure people just really live an extraordinary life. And we talk about that a lot on this episode. And I could sit here and I could tell you all about him and his story and all the stuff, but I'd rather just he do it and you'll get to know a little bit more about him in our conversation. So with that being said, let's bring Alan onto the show. Alan, welcome to the podcast, brother. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. I know that you're doing a lot of great work and uh, I'm so grateful to be connected to you. Now you're up in Montreal today. Do you live in Montreal or in Vancouver? It's a great question. (laughs) Uh, It's kind of part of my spiritual journey because I was born in Montreal Okay. And I moved to Vancouver over 25 years ago. For 20 some years, I was in Vancouver, spent a year in Toronto, went back to Vancouver. And over a month ago, I decided to come back to Montreal. I might go back and forth between here and Vancouver, but I'm really grateful to be here because I, I have my brother, I have nephews, I have good friends here. And ever since I've arrived back, there's something about being at home, being in your roots, I love the French Canadians. They're full of life and passion. So I feel really good being back here. So for now, I'm back here, at least for the summer. Amazing. Have you ever been to France by any chance? I'm just curious. I, I've been to Europe three times, and I was in France a couple of times. It's quite different. Quebec, have you ever been to Montreal or in I France? Haven't, I, haven't, I haven't been up to, to Montreal or Quebec area yet. Well, you'll have to come visit. I would love that. Make sure it's in the summer. Of course. Uh, but of course, you guys are crazy with your cold weather. I have clients up there. I don't know how you guys do it. Uh, uh, that's why I go back to Vancouver. At least it's moderate <laughs> there. I love it. But fr- fr- France is very different than Montreal. France mm-hmm. is kind of sophisticated. A lot of there's a lot of history, but the people are quite opposite. French Canadians are a bit more guttural, but very alive, passionate, fun-loving. Joy. It's called joie de vivre, the joy of life. And I think I've benefited by being here in that regard, because when you live here, it infuses your soul. Mm. So when I came back here, I said, wow, people are so alive here compared to almost anywhere else I've been. So it's great to be here. Yeah, the reason I asked that question, you know, I I live here in Texas. I I love Texas. I've traveled a a whole lot. and, And Texas is definitely a place that feels like home. But another place that I've been that feels like home for me. Uh, is Ireland and England, which is for for me, a lot of my ancestry comes from Ireland and England. Correct. It's it's interesting when I've traveled, there's some places that I get to and I'm like, man, this land just feels like home. These people feel like home. So I was curious if it was similar for you. And it's all, it's true. It's similar for me. And also there's so much history. Like when you go to Europe, 
there's a classiness to it, the architecture. In North America, we have a lot of, they're good and bad in everywhere you go. In North America, like, there's a lot of malls after malls after malls after malls. So when you see the architecture and you sense the, the history, there's something to be said about that as well. But wherever we are, we are. Yeah. So how did you get into this whole Zen? I know you have like the Zen zone mindset training. So how in the world did you even get involved in Zen mindset stuff? Well, you know, I've, I've asked that question a lot and it'd be really brief. When I was 13, my mother was diagnosed with cancer and told she had six months to live. She lived about 15 years. So my mother was my first role model of the power of the human spirit. Mm. When I was 19, my father died. I was at the time taking a bachelor in psychology uh, you know, in university. And although I knew I wanted to help people, I was kind of lost and confused. So I traveled around the world for about a year, went to one country after another, after another, after another. And I said, is that all there is? There was something still missing for me. And then I had a life changing experience on the desert, came close to dying, freaked me out, came back to Montreal. And then I met these two people that at the time were living at what was called the Zen Meditation Center of Montreal. And they had these calm, clear, centered eyes. And they invited me there. There were about 30 of them, all with the same calm eyes. And I said, I want that. Yeah. I moved in, lived like a monk for nine years until I missed women too much. And then I left the monastery. Love it, dude. So I want to go back to this desert uh, experience. What desert was that? That was at the Mediterranean. I was living in a kibbutz in Israel at the time. And there was a day that I didn't realize it was going up to 125 degrees. Mm -hmm. And I walked without a hat, without much to eat. And I spent all day going in and out of the Mediterranean Sea. Nobody was there because it was April. And when I started walking back, my heart started palpitating faster and faster and faster. And I'll never forget, there was just one tree. And I fell under the tree. There was a little transistor radio. And in my mind, I was ready gone, finished. That's the end of my life. And miraculously, I woke up and I was on some Yemenites balcony and they told me that a lot of people die of heat stroke and I had a heat stroke mm. and they took me back to the kibbutz. And that very night, I met a woman who was very spiritual. She said, you're going to return to Montreal. You're going to meet a teacher and you're going to get into spirituality because up until then I was pretty atheistic. Mm. So tell me, how did you transition from atheistic to actually this experience of, I would call it God, but, you know, people call it different things, spirit, source, universe. How, how, it, how was that for you? It, it was very, uh, it, I guess the best way to describe it is any religion that had just a blind belief in God as a big man with a beard in the sky didn't resonate with me at all. I, I needed something more practical and more experiential. So when I went to the Zen center and started to meditate at the very beginning, my mind was very hyperactive, like a lot of people who start meditation. And so as the calmer I got, the more centered I got. And it was almost like the Japanese call it a Kensho experience, which is the initial enlightenment sort of experience where you go, wow, the light bulb goes on. It's calm, clear. There's that state of centeredness. And so when I experienced that, it wasn't a blind belief. Yeah. It was an experience of my higher self or God. And that's how I really, that's, that's what I resonated with. So good. I, I've done a lot of uh, work studying the work of uh, Werner Ahart, who had, you know, kind of the father of landmark and, and all of that. I don't know if you. I attended that many moons ago. Awesome. So I don't know when, and when you attended his work, if, if he was talking about the concept, which was, if you believed in God, then you don't, you, you had essentially no idea of what God was. And he had this whole argument and, and I can't do it justice as Werner does, because he's, he's just a, a master uh, with words and, and communication, uh, just with deep concepts. But if we have to say, well, we believe in God, then we, we believe in nothing because like you, you said, like it, it wasn't a belief. It wasn't a mental construct of your mind of this, this thing. It was, you experienced it. It was the experience, and, and, and that's where ultimately maybe the soul is. It's just in the experience. Would you agree with this kind of Werner's philosophy and your own experience? Absolutely, because nothing was going to change my mind about anything unless I actually experienced it. I could say the same thing for reincarnation. Yeah. Reincarnation, when somebody says to me, Alan, do you believe in reincarnation? I say, no, I know it. And how do you know it? And then I say, 
well, if I'm in love with this person and I tell you that I'm in love with this person, you say, prove it. I don't have to prove it. I know it. I know I'm in love in the same way that I know reincarnation is real. And, and that came from deep deepening my meditation. So I agree with you. For me, it was only going to happen uh, if I actually experienced results and transformed rather than just out of blind belief, uh, say, I believe. Yeah. What have been some of like the real world practical results you've experienced through like your Zen mindset, meditation and, and some of those practices? Well, it's interesting because when after nine years of intense meditation, chanting and, and the like, uh, when I, I kind of felt I, I was really missing something. And when I re-entered the, the, the ordinary world, I realized that getting into the Zen zone and spirituality unless it's connected to every aspect of life, was going to be limited. And not only was it going to be limited, because I was a bit of a basket case when I got back into the world. And I realized, too, that it was, it was good because I tapped into the Zen zone. But the negative side is I wasn't an integrated person. So I realized quite quickly that unless I connect all the missing parts it was going to be very limited. And I realized meditation wasn't the only answer because when I got into meditation and try to teach meditation, there was one woman friend. I, I said, oh, meditate. You got to meditate. You got to meditate. The more she meditated, the more angry she got because she never dealt with her emotions. So that's a one way that I realized later when I came out to Vancouver that my destiny was to create a holistic approach to what I call the nine-step formula to tap into the Zen zone and stay there, inner fitness, inner calmness, inner confidence, and start mastering your communication. So it connects the whole person. That was the reason I did that. What's your definition of an of like an integrated person? I I, I believe, and my experience has been, it's it's super important. And most people are not integrated. Um, and I think a lot of people have a concept that they think Zen and and and, and that type of thing is nothing, right? Not it's nothingness. It, if you have thoughts, they mean nothing. Like a, a Zen mindset is really, I don't know how to put this into words. It's almost like maybe the logos, the, the nothingness, consciousness, which is, that's one side of the paradox, right? Order. But then you have the other side of the paradox, which would be the chaos and the expression and maybe potentially emotion. What's your thoughts on being, what it requires to be an integrated person? Well, your question, which is so profound and wonderful, is the very reason I've spent 30 years in the laboratory yeah. to come up with what I teach people now in that one of my ma mentors that I love very much and helped me a lot was Ramdas. You probably know Ramdas, Richard Alpert. Are yeah. you familiar with his work? Yes. So he talked about emptiness because in Zen, they talk about form and emptiness. Mm -hmm. Emptiness is form. Form is emptiness. The trouble with a lot of us, including myself, when I first got into Zen, is I was seeking the empty emptiness, meaning I just wanted to be free. Yes. I wanted my mind to be quiet. I wanted to get away from the noise. I wanted to get away from the dysfunction. So to experience the deep level of inner peace and tranquility was what I thought I was mainly after. I was after it, but only partially in that the so-called emptiness or the calmness and the centeredness should be the focus, the basis of everything else, that everything else ripples out of that. So if, if I can paint a picture, which I often do, if the Zen zone is here, it's connected to the emotions, it's connected to the mind, the rational mind, it's connected to the physical body, which ultimately is connected to our relationships. So if our mental psychological stuff is out of whack, hyperactive thinking, negative thinking, emotional turbulence, limits our ability to get in the Zen zone, there's a lot of dysfunction and difficulty we're going to experience. But if we get in the Zen zone as the higher self leading the show, mm. transform our mind into positive, channel our emotions into joy and passion and enthusiasm, channel our physical activity into balance, and then ultimately mastering our communication day by day business and personal, all those cylinders need to be working. And that's why I created the nine step process that I did. So good. And I think somebody listening to this, because this is super profound, maybe they'd listen to what you just said and be like, well, that's really complicated. 
what what advice would you have for them as they're like looking at all of this and they're like, well, how do you even pull pull all of that off? That seems really complicated. It seems like a lot of work. <laughs> well, my my answer to that is living a dysfunctional life is much more complicated than that. It's actually quite simple. The nine steps are very simple because if you just if you do a couple of things that let go some of the negativity of your past, which you don't have to spend years on. It's You can speed up the process of letting go of the dysfunction. If you get clear on your vision, which is part of what I teach people, if you build your inner power, inner muscles, like getting in the gym, you do physical fitness exercise. So you do inner fitness exercises. And then, then beyond that, number five is action and accountability to build your lifestyle with goal setting, different types of goal setting. Now your personal power is being built. And then when you get challenged, number six is how do you respond to the challenges of life? That's where the self-mastery comes. And within 60 to 90 days, you get to that level. And then you, I could teach people advanced motivational techniques. So one to seven is empowering yourself. And then all you have to do there is for the rest of your life, master our communication skills like we're sharing with each other today. Mm -hmm. So it's actually quite simple. And if someone told me, many moons ago that I could have gone through a 90 day program and got to a high level is, instead of spending nine years as a monk. <laughs> and then all the other things I went through, it's actually very fast. Yeah. Has anybody ever told you you're crazy? They never use that word, but I would think that some people, whether their family members thought I was eccentric or weird, you know, what was he doing in a monastery? Um, certainly family are a lot tougher you, on you than other people. Some people would think I'm weird, but no one's ever said I'm crazy, but I'm sure some people thought it or think it, but it doesn't bother me because I, I feel great about who I am and that's their projection and it doesn't, it doesn't affect me at all. So the reason I ask you that question is I, I think what you've done is brilliant and the man who you are is incredible. And I think a lot of people, they have these, these, I don't know, their soul's calling them somewhere, this, this calling that's pulling them somewhere, and they don't give themselves permission to, to follow that lead because they're worried what other people would think about them. Maybe they've been called crazy or weird or strange or eccentric. And I'm curious how you have navigated that to be so comfortable in your own skin to actually follow your calling. <laughs> it's such a great question. And to answer that, if you think or if anybody thinks that this is the way I've been all my life, feeling good in my own skin. They're deadly wrong. As a matter of fact, my whole life was about living in the shadow of my brother who was Mr. Everything. Okay. Going to see him Thursday. It's his birthday. We have a great relationship now. Well, we always did. But my brother was first in his medical school, so good looking, a popular. He was everything. I was a good athlete, but I, I was quite insecure, even though uh, people you know, like me, and I was semi-popular, I was always very hard on myself and self-critical. I would say 90% of the people that come to my practice are people that are hard on themselves. I think most people in the world are like that. They're self-critical, hard on themselves. And that's why they can't really get into deep-centered, I would call soulmate relationships yet. So for me, my whole life was about changing that to the point where I got so fed up with the patterns that I had because I was attracting, in my case, women who were not emotionally available. Yes. So it was at that point where I said, either I'm going to end up in a mental institute yes. or I'm going to learn to love myself. And I got so fed up with the pattern of worry, being worried about what people think and trying so hard to impress myself. As a matter of fact, even recently, Ant uh, Anthony, uh, you notice my hair is gray. So up until about two years ago, I, I dyed my hair and I dyed it because I wanted to stay looking young. And my friend Lisa, when I spent a year living in Toronto, kept saying to me, let your hair be natural. Let it be. And I said, no, no, I want to look young. I, wanna... I finally gave in and I did so. I never had, I'm not saying I look young, but I, I never had so many compliments, especially from women say, you look better than ever. You look great. You're authentic. You look like Sean Connery. And I said, now I'm ready to die. <laughs> I love it. I, I think it looks good, good myself as well. It looks nice. Thank you. Do you think part of the reason that we're so self-critical is just for self-preservation? It's the part of our ego who feels like if we're not accepted, like the animal instinct part of us, we're going to be cast out of the tribe. 
So therefore we would die theoretically, at least in our mind. And is that the reason we were probably so self-critical is for self-preservation to be accepted by the tribe? I think it's opening up. Yeah, I, I mean, the way I would, could you still hear me? Cause I see it says, yeah. well, you're okay? Yes. Okay. The way I view it, and I'm sure there are many ways to view it, is that as young children, more than we're not developed to the point that you and I are right now, we are almost totally dependent or maybe totally dependent on our mother and father. And I often tell people when they say, I really am looking for a love relationship. And I said, I hope you are, because most people in my experience are looking for mommy and daddy in a younger body, because most of us have not experienced the unconditional love and respect from society around us, including our family, not blaming them at all in any way. And because of that, we have such a need for love, such a need for respect, that many of us grow up with that focus and will do anything to get that respect and love. And I spent years trying to impress people on how well I was doing in my business. And if I go on on dates, I try to impress them to imagine that I'm richer than I really was, you know. And so I think many people in the world live like that, where they're hard on themselves, they'll do anything to get love. And there comes a point where you say the gig is up, it's over, I don't want to live like that anymore. And the day that you get to that, I call it the fed up stage. And until you get to the fed up stage, if you don't, like I was talking to a lady friend last week, and she said she wants to grow and change. But I knew because I could tell the lack of commitment in her voice that she she's not going to change. She's going to go back to her dysfunctional relationship. because She's not ready to let that go. And that's exactly what happened. So hopefully there'll come a time when she said, OK, that's it. I like I respect myself too much and life is too short. I want to live it fully. So people do get to that place. But a minority of people are in that wonderful place. Is there a. Is there a place inside a committed relationship where potentially in not, uh, I'll just use an archetypical relationship where the, the man can be the father, the woman could be the mother, and they're both bringing one another love and healing and, and growth, but they're not doing it from a place where it's in drama, where they're like, oh, I need a father. So the, the husband is like, oh, I shall be this archetype and I'll do my work to be that for you. And the husband is that I need a mother and the woman's like, oh, I'll do my own inner work. I'll be that for you. Is there a place where they can do it because it's coming as an overflow of who they are and they also are bringing healing to one another to actually then evolve past that to then continue co-creating together beyond the mother and father archetypes? Does that make sense? Well, your questions are so profound and you probably know the answers anyway to these questions, but yeah. you're, a great, you're a great interviewer. It's such a profound question. It's all about, it, it connects to the soulmate revolution that I'm about to launch because one of my passions all my life was to help soulmates come together. Now, based on what I've learned through my own development and my own coaching is that unless we tap into our own inner soulmate first, we're not going to be able to have a high level quality soulmate relation. Oh, we might meet different soulmates, but they might be dysfunctional until we grow in our inner soulmate enough. And that inner soulmate, when you get to that level, when a man, if we're going to talk man and woman, you, you could talk about non-heterosexual as well. But if we're talking heterosexual, is a man, I think the ideal is we all have male energy and female energy. If a man becomes a man and feels good in his own skin, and a woman feels great in her own skin, the woman is not intimidated. Some of my women friends who are, most, are I consider the most developed women I've ever met, love having their door being opened for them, love being nurtured, love being treated like a woman, not because they need the man. They're just playing their role as a woman and love to be nurtured. As I, as a man, I love it when a woman says to me, there's a woman friend of me more than anyone who says, Alan, you're brilliant. <gasps> now, I'm not insecure that I need to hear that, but I feel wonderful. And if I was ever going to get with my next soulmate, if that's in the destiny plan, it would be a woman, only a woman who's working on herself enough that I and her could be two developed souls who could play those roles without dysfunction. Yeah. 
Awesome. Now, for me, I have recently really felt like a pull to go back and get involved inside uh, the church. So I go over to, to Gateway, uh, the Christian church. And I've, I've had this experience as of this year that I've never experienced in my entire life. When I, when I go into like worship and there's music and it's this crazy band and mm -hmm. like, really good, I cry. Like I just break down and I cry and I'll go with my daughter. My daughter's two and a half and I'll watch her and I'll just cry, man. I just cry. And it wasn't until last week I realized why I was crying. It was because I'm in the presence of the father the divine masculine and there's this earthly piece of me who didn't experience that amount of father from my earthly father that I'm experiencing from this thing that I'm calling the heavenly father, the universe, whatever you want to call it. Right? So how does one enter into the mother to start creating that holistic integration with self? If we can access it through maybe potentially worship or entering into the presence of the divine father, I think, People know how to access that. How do they access it for the divine mother? Is that self-love or is it something different? No, I think you're on the right track there. I can only again speak for myself and what I've seen in others is that I was very guarded for a long time. So, you know, like a lot of men, for example, not all men, but a lot of men either in their head or you know what, in making money or sexuality, they always want to have, so they talk about sex or they talk about making money. Not a lot of men in my experience are, oh, I'm having a wonderful relationship. I'm growing very well <laughs> within my, 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 what, with my relationship with my wife. So I know in my case, there came a time where I realized I was too stiff. I asked five women friends, how do you view me? And they all said the same thing. You're really intelligent. You're a wonderful guy, but you're way too stiff. You're way too uh, uptight. And I, I started to realize that I needed to lighten up a little bit. And I started to let go my guard. And I started to do things. I started to dance more. I started to do some of my inner fitness exercise, not just meditation. I would chant and then bring out my emotion. I would cry more. I would laugh more. I would get angry in a healthy way. And I found that by channeling, getting more vulnerable with me, by getting more into self-loving of me, getting a massage, not being afraid to receive because I was so used to giving and not receiving. And I was afraid to hear positive things or to receive a hug. I started to consciously do things that were bringing out more of my own female qualities. Mm. And that's how I found I was able to tap into more of that motherly, if you want to call it, side. So the female side, is it just more expression, like trusting your own desires and like more of that eccentric side, more of that expression? Well, whatever I've been taught about fe female and male energy, and I did attend a workshop, which was quite interesting. And it talked about, we all have male energy and female energy. So they listed a lot of qualities of a male energy, focus, goals, scoring, discipline, time management, achievement, and so on. And the female qualities of self-expression, emotionality, vulnerability. And they said, a lot of us are at different levels. Some men have 70% male qualities, 30% female qualities. Some men have 30% male qualities. So we all have a balance of both. The key is, I think, according to what I learned in that workshop, which made sense, is that we see what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are, and we try to balance it out as much as we can. So that's what I think is it's not just all men or just totally. all women. Totally. Yeah, I totally agree that we're, we all have masculine and feminine energy or the yin and yang light. Yeah, whatever we order chaos, whatever terminology we want to wrap around it. For Absolutely. sure. What are some of the, the filters, the subconscious filters that you've had to transcend during your lifetime thus far? Could, could you uh, describe what you mean by filters? Yeah, so some of the belief systems that you were raised with from your culture, from your family, from your parents, what are some of those belief systems that you've had to look at and then maybe create new belief systems around that have really served you? I would say a big one has to do with success. I think that there was always this, the way I was brought up, it was like, I wasn't brought up with this attitude, uh, money could be wonderful, prosperity could be wonderful. 
I always thought it was more important to be what I thought was humble. And it's good to be humble and it's good to be simple. And people don't have to be millionaires to be successful. I'm certainly not. But I, I think I had a fear of money. I think I had a, a, a bad attitude. I always thought that money automatically meant that the person was greedy or an aggressive salesperson or someone who wanted to show off their boat or car or whatever it be. So I then learned over the years that it's not a black and white kind of thing and there's nothing wrong with feeling good about success. I would say that's a big one. The other one, which is huge for me, was around relationship. It is I was so hard on myself and my physical body. I saw myself as too skinny. And I, to the point where when I was in summer, I know it sounds funny because a lot of people have, have a challenge when they're overweight and they don't realize that men especially could also uh, have an issue about being too thin. But it was so bad that when I attended summer camp and everyone had to go down to the swim, swimming for swimming, I'd be hiding out in the bunk and they would call Alan Knight down to the waterfront. <laughs> it was the worst feeling in the world, you know? Mm -hmm. So I had a very negative attitude toward my body and I was very hard on it. I thought the body we have to eat and the organs inside it. I always saw it as something gross as opposed to a great vehicle to live our life in the world. I say those, those two were pretty big. And then when you shifted your relationship to your body, did you start taking more personal responsibility for the food you put in it and how much you move your body and things of that nature? Or how has that shifted? It shifted in a few ways. Yes, I became more conscious of what I put into it, but I never became, and maybe it's to a fault, I never became... Um, obsessive around eating really healthy. Like I kind of eat in a balanced way and don't criticize myself for it. I came to Montreal, which is known for smoked meat. I went for a smoked meat sandwich, you know? Now I, I should be eating better. It's, an, it's a kind of a lifelong battle or a challenge that I've had. But I, I, I definitely became more conscious of that. But I think more importantly, I came to really learn to accept and love myself like my own little child. Someone once asked me many years ago, Alan, when you look in the mirror, can you say that you love that guy like you would your own son if you had one? And I knew that the answer was no. Yeah. And now when I was 20, I looked, I looked at a picture the other day of me in my, I think I was 22, just graduating from university, I think. And I said, wow, I was so good looking. And then I thought about it and I said, I was miserable. I was miserable. Now I'm an old man, so to speak. I feel like a teenager. I feel fun loving. I think I'm cute. I think I'm fun and I feel free. So, you know, what does that tell me? I've learned to love myself. Of course, I'm better if I eat better. Of course, it's better if I exercise more. But to me, the most important thing, whether I've got a few extra pounds or not, it's not about that. It's about loving and accepting myself as I am. So good. And you've talked about today some of like the, the nine uh, parts uh, for somebody to enter into the Zen zone. And, and, and I'm already connecting dots of when somebody's doing that, that's then allowing them essentially to heal the masculine and feminine within themselves, whatever that is for them, different things for different people, which then allows them to call in or maybe increase their current relationship they have, or maybe call in their, their soulmate. What are, what are some practical tips, advice that you could give somebody to really take their relationship to the next level, whether, yeah, they're in a committed relationship or maybe they want to call in a committed relationship? Well, you know, to me, always, when I look at my nine-step formula that I developed, I wanted to develop something very simple and practical. So the first step is we do an assessment. So if somebody does an assessment, it'll take about 30, 45 minutes, and they're going to rate themselves in about 35, 40 categories. And then, then they have an x-ray right in front of them, they can now see their strengths and weaknesses. And it becomes clear. And I ask them a very interesting question, Anthony. I say, if you got up tomorrow morning, and you saw your cell phone was working at 30% efficiency, how quickly would it take to call the phone company? Oh, right away. Laptop, car, right away. How many of you do you get up in the morning, look in the mirror and say, Oh, my God, I'm only working at 10, 20, 30% of my capacity in personal development and communication mastery. I got to get some help. We don't. We put ourselves on the back burner. Okay. So if we could 
get that assessment and see, here's my strengths. Here's my weaknesses. Every month I'm going to redo the exercise to watch my scores increase. Then it makes sense to go to step number two, which is healing the negative past. And we have exercises around that. Then number three is to crystallize your vision, to get clear on your direction and who you are with an emotional attitude. No one's going to get me off track from living my dream lifestyle. One, two, and three are easy peasy within a week. It's done. Now the heavy lifting starts number four, which is tapping into your inner power. That's where I teach people inner muscle techniques and exercises. So now if they're going to live their dream lifestyle, they got to be emotionally, spiritually, and mentally sound. And so now all those parts get strengthened. Five is now action and accountability. You got to build your lifestyle with accountability, time management, prioritization. So four and five, build your personal power. Six is dealing with the obstacles and challenges, which we're all going to have, how to pick ourselves up by the bootstraps when we go off track, to get back on track, back on track. In Buddhism, they call this, they have a Daruma doll, which as you push it over, it comes back up. Yeah. That really reflects getting back to the enlightened mind. When my clients get to that level, that's when the fun starts. Because seven is tapping into your personal magnetism. And one to seven overall is your personal empowerment altogether. You accept, respect, and love yourself like your own child. Now we could teach people number eight, which is mastering your communication, because the techniques and content is easy peasy. And 80% oozes out from the inside. So that's why as people go through this, they transform quite quickly. And then that's a self-coaching system for life. They get off track. They know exactly what to do to get back on track. Amazing. And if you could go back in time and uh, give yourself some wisdom to help you collapse time and get results faster, what would you tell your, your younger self? Oh, that's a really, your questions are among the best I've ever had. Um, I would tell myself, of course, I don't want to look back and regret anything, but I would be much more motivated to say to myself, Alan, no more procrastination. You are going to take action more and more consistently and use every day because there's been a lot of death in my family mm. and I've learned not to take one day for granted. And I've come close to death many times myself, but I would say to myself, I want you to take extra steps each day to yes, do it with freedom and joyful spirit, but I want you to become a lot more productive every day on a consistent basis. That's what I would tell myself. Awesome. Well, Alan, dude, thank you so much for being here. If people want to learn more about your system, maybe they want to work with you, where can they go to connect with you at? Well, right now they can go to alanknight.com, which is my website. They can actually go to soulmaterevolution.com, which we're just starting off. But the one thing I'll mention that my main focus now is my certified training course. So if there are people out there that want to be coaches, but don't have an existing program, then uh, I want to train people all around the world in different languages different personalities, different target audiences. If anyone is interested in being a coach, they can get through to me at alan at alanknight.com. Awesome. Dude, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you, Alan. Thank you. It's an honor, and you were the best interviewer I've ever had. Well, thank you. Well, there you have it, the extraordinary Alan Knight. What a wonderful conversation. I like guess it's, it's not every day that you just get to jam with someone on these, like just taking a deep dive into this deep Eastern philosophical stuff, making it practical to, to everyday life. So I just hope you enjoyed it. I hope it inspired you and I hope it really like fed your intellectual and your spiritual soul a bit as well. So that's all I have for you in this episode of the Anthony John Weeks podcast. If you know someone who needs to hear this episode, send it over to them in their direct messages, screenshot it, share it on social media, send them an email, text message, whatever you have to do to get this episode into their ear holes. And also please keep the five-star reviews coming over on iTunes because that's what helps get this show found and serve more people. So thank you so much for being here today. Until next time, my friend, I'm out. Peace. Well, that's all I've got for this episode of the Anthony John Amix podcast, but we have plenty more to help you become unstoppable in life and business. So head on over to ajamix.com for exclusive resources, information, and tools to help you break through to a new level of freedom, purpose, and success. I look forward to having you back for the next episode. Bye for now.